Good evening, bonsoir. Welcome to this uh, Ecole de Modernité lecture. I'm happy to welcome tonight uh, to this lecture at the Giacometti Lab in Paris, um, Professor Ching Ching Wu, um, who uh, comes um, from Rutgers University here in Paris to give the lecture. Uh, Ching Ching Wu is an associate professor in the art history program at Rogers, and um, her research focuses on modernism, colonialism, and Buddhism in cross-cultural and global um, artistic contexts. Um, I'd, I'll just mention a few of her books uh, that were uh, previously released. Uh, one of them is a monograph on Koga Haure. I'm sorry if I mispronounced uh, no, his name, but you, you'll correct me afterwards. Um, it's called Parallel Modernism. Koga Haure it was published in 2018, as much as um, another one called Avant Garde Art in Modern Japan, published um, at the University of California Press in Berkeley. Um, and one of the book. Related to uh, tonight's lecture is also Truth Through Immersion, a biography of painter Tsai Yun Yan, uh, published at the Yushuan Chambushe in, um, in Taipei in 2018. Tonight's lecture uh, was entitled by Professor Wu, Parallel Modernism, the Avant-Garde Between Paris and Japan. And, and, and the very subject is to uh, study how the connection between Paris and various places, but mainly Tokyo in, in, in Japan, um, how those connections were um, built and through which uh, characters uh, such modern movements, such as Cubism or Surrealism, um, came to develop in Japan in connection with Paris. Um, so we'll see through various figures such as um, Kurada Jutaro, Yabe Tomoe, Kawachi Kigai, and I'll stop here the uh, massacre of the uh, names. Um, I'll, I'll let you pronounce them correctly and introduce us to um, the work of those artists who contributed in the, um, to the development of those, um, those movements and those forms of art uh, between Paris and, and Japan. So thank you very much, uh, Cheng Cheng, for accepting this uh, invitation for coming here in Paris and give the lecture. And um, well, I'll let you talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hugo, and I want to thanks a lot for um, the Institute Giacometti to invite me to this very nice place, and uh, I also want to thank everyone to come um, during this very nice spring day uh, in Paris. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm just going to start my lecture. So in the history of development of modern art in Japan, Paris played a very important role as a place where many Japanese artists gained the first-hand experience of both modern art and classical art in the West. From the late 19th century, many Japanese artists visited Paris for a longer or shorter period of the time. For example, one of, the, one of the most important and influential Japanese modern artists, Kudo, Kuroda Seiki, um, persuade his art training in Paris. After returning back to Japan in 1893, um, he established a comprehensive curriculum of Western style painting at the most prestigious art school in Japan, the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. This curriculum combined um, academicism and impressionism, two main artistic approaches that Kuroda had studied in Paris. This curriculum introduced by Kuroda went on uh, to become the dominant mode of art practice in both Japan and its colonial empire. While Kuroda Seiki uh, was an extremely successful case. For most Japanese artists, getting to Paris 
was not easy. It required a strong financial support and good physical condition. Although a number of Japanese artists maintained, um, sorry, managed to travel to Paris in the first half of the 20th century, in today's talk, I will focus on selected Japanese artists who stay in Paris for a few years in the 1920s, placing then, um, their activities in the context of two main art movements, Cubism and Surrealism. I will explore how those two art movements were practiced and understood in Japan, and how Japanese artists who went to Paris brought back new approaches that reshaped the contours of modernism in Japan. So I will basically maybe come you know, back and forth and talk about some artists who were active in Paris in 20s a little bit, and then we'll move to the focus to Japan, uh, talking about you know, Cubism and Surrealism in Japan. So unlike Kuroda Seiki, you know, many of the Japanese artists who arrived in Paris in the 1920s had already had basic Western art training, especially in the academic impressionism style they study at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts or other similar institute. So the slide you are looking at right now is kind of like a very typical, uh, the so-called academic impressionist style that Kurola Seiki um, kind of demonstrated um, from the late 19th century until like early 20th century. So um, those artists who went to Paris um, in 1920s already have some knowledge of modernism mainly from the publications, um, reports from the other Japanese artists who went to Europe before them, and a limited number of artworks that were available to be viewed in Japan. So, you know, in Japan, they also started to have some exhibition. They brought back some works, you know, from Europe and around the world, but it's very limited. Um, so those Japanese artists stay in Paris um, they, this chance of staying in Paris gave them um, uh, a, a opportunity to deepen their lang knowledge of Western art history to gain um, exposure to the newer avant-garde ideas and artworks through the first-hand experience and to interact with contemporary artists in Paris. Um, their pre-existing ideas on modernism will play a role in how they approach modern art while in Paris, and vice versa, their experience in Paris and other parts of Europe would also affect how they continue um, de developing their own styles and approaches after returning to Japan. Moreover, the artworks they send back to Japan, their reports on um, their experience and the art activities they held after returning to Japan had an outsized influence um, on the continuing development of modernism in Japan more broadly. So my point is like even when they were in Paris or around the world, they still you know, sent their report uh, back to Japan um, or sometimes they even sent their works you know, back to Japan to, to display. As I argue in my book, Peril Modernism, when a new modern art movements emerge in Japan, um, it often coexists in close peril with other modernisms around the world, um, but processes their own internal logic. Uh, Japanese modernism adopt flexibly and organically to outside stimuli while maintaining an internal cohesion. A new art movement only became meaningful when its new form or approaches began to integrate with local concerns and practice. Western style art has undergone a lengthy 
uh, process of internal development in Japan um, since the Western artist idea had first been imported in the late 19th century. But by the time in 1920s, Japanese artists and intellectuals had developed sufficient self-awareness and self-confidence to question and uh, criticize new uh, modern movements uh, originating in Europe. And accordingly, the arrival of new art concepts and new art movements in Japan often went through a long process of hesitation, rejection, re-evaluation, and recreation. So I'm going to give you a case um, in Japan um, because uh, uh, especially focus on Cubism. Um, since Cubism is a good example of this kind of process in Japan. Um, so when several Japanese artists who were in Paris in 1911 visiting the exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists where many Cubist works were first publicly displayed, um, the fact is most of them were not interested in this new art movement, um, either hesitating to accept Cubism or in many cases simply ignoring it. Um, so the, the one you're uh, looking at the screen is one of the very few example. Um, Ishii Hakute was you know, in Paris around that time and he did a little sketch about you know, Cubist work. Um, but the interesting thing is you know, he went to interview the other artists and they were not very interesting about this new art movement. Um, it was not until the other Japanese artists and the critics in Japan or um, elsewhere began to come out their own interpretations of Cubism that Cubism started to become more meaningful to um, Japanese artists. In 1910s Japan, uh, Cubism was generally uh, categorized under the broader concept of anti-national uh, naturalism um, and subjectivity. Within this broader, you know, categories, um, Cubism tend to be grouped together with futures and expressionism, abstract art, and phobism since they are all new trends um, which seems to be in opposition to the dominant style in 1910s Japan, Impressionism. So, you know, um, my main argument is like they need to really, you know, see how Cubism was, you know, placed in this their pre-exist understanding of modern art to be able to approach or make this new album meaningful. Yet, as the Japanese artists began to understand Cubism more, a number of criticisms also emerged. The most common critique of Cubism was that it was meaningless, <laughs> divorced of content, and concerned only with empty formalism. Uh, for example, uh, here is, I'm showing you on the screen this example of um, the artist and art critic, and uh, you can call like um, you know uh, the intellectual whose name is uh, Kimura Shohaki. Um, he actually translates you know entire book about Cubism into Japanese around that time, but after his translation, he concludes that here's the quote: um, Cubism is the degeneration of modern art. <laughs> the reason why it's that everything is decided on a conceptual basis. You know, when people decide everything based on concepts, it is because they have no life, you know, life got nai kalada. They totally don't understand life. They don't understand human beings. They don't understand the most simple and most crucial things. Their feet do not touch the ground. So I think I just like to give you some example, like their hesitation, and they have some criticism. You know, when they're facing this new art movement. Um, so in other words, you know, there was a general demand in Japanese art circles that art should go beyond only questions of forms, and also emphasize the issues of subject matters and motif. 
um, the prominent voices in Japanese art circles argue that art should connect with daily life and cultural rather than simply experiment with new forms. So within this context, um, young artists who chose to work in a cubist style feel obligated to choose a meaningful subject matter. So what is this meaningful subject matter? Um, here I'm going to show you the example um, by Koga Harue. Um, he chose a religious subject matter while painting his cubist works. Um, here's his painting, Canon. Painting in 1921, for example, depicting one of the most popular Buddhist deities in East Asia, Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. While the subject matter is immediately recognizable, you know, featuring the Bodhisattva sitting in the center with a golden flint background um, and a flower in the front, the flickering and the semi-transparent plants added a distinctly cubist flavor to the painting. Similarly, Koga's other cubist paintings, such as the burial, nirvana, and the birds, demonstrate his interest in combining a cubist style with religious theme. Yet, um, this, his interest in uh, cubist style extended beyond simply borrowing the modern cubist visual language. In addition, Koga sought to bridge classical painting techniques from both Europe and Japan. For example, in his painting Burial, which you can see on the left, um, Koga drew inspiration from the renowned 16th and 17th century Spanish painter El Greco, uh, whose painting you can see on the right. Um, and you can see because both in terms of the subject matter, things, um, you can see both painting depict burial, and in composition, since you can see both painting arrange the burial thing in the middle and a group of figures surrounding it, including religious and um, late figures. Here is the burial thing. El Greco included himself and his son in his painting. Um, you can see this is El Greco himself, and then this is his son. So I did a little bit of like visual comparisons. Um, you can find more detail in my book. Um, this is a Koga's painting, and then um, let me give you a little background about his painting. Koga created this painting after his wife gave birth to a stillborn daughter. Um, so I also found, you know, there's a man and there's a girl, um, you know, uh, who's holding, t uh, the man is holding a bouquet um, in Kenny's painting. And then so um, to, um, according to comparisons, I argue that Koga's painting may indicate Koga himself and then his imagined daughter, uh, who is uh, in the only figure looking at the viewer, um, if he composed them in his painting. Koga's Nirvana, uh, which uh, you can see on the left, uh, on the other hand, was inspired by Japanese visual tradition. Um, Nirvana is a very, very common Buddhist scene in Japanese Buddhist iconography, you know, depicting the latest, uh, last moment of the Buddha uh, in the human rhyme. So we can see the com by comparison to this traditional painting on the right, you know, Koga used the conventional composition, which put the Buddha in the center, you know, both Buddha in the center, uh, lying horizontally and surrounding by his disciple. Um, but, you know, if you see closely, whether the, in the traditional Japanese painting, the disciples are sitting on the floor, um, and uh, their identities are given by their clothing. In Koga's version on the left, um, the figures are more stylized and uh, anomalous. Their clothing is less like um, that found in the traditional East Asian Buddhist iconography. 
and more like that of a traditional Christian iconography. Moreover, the composition, you know, while the deity is standing in the clouds and, um, you know, occupy the upper half of the canvas, you can see here, you know, it's actually uh, in a traditional iconography, this is uh, Buddha's uh, a mother descending to, uh, from the sky to winning this, this moment. Um, but Koga's compositions didn't take this traditional, you know, iconography as a very small, you know, group of clouds. Um, but it's like huge, occupied one third of the images. And I argue like it probably is more similar to El Guico's, the bearer of the uh, Council of Ogres. All right, so now we are moving to Paris. <laughs> While Koga was experimenting with combining a cubist style with classical motifs around the same time, another Japanese artist named Kuroda Jutalo departed for Europe on what he called his European art pilgrimage. He arrived in Paris in 1921 he had already decided that he would not work in the Impressionist style, but his knowledge of the latest artist development after Impressionism was limited to symbolism. Although he knew the basic theory of Cubism, he had not had a chance to view um, many Cubist artworks. Around this time, um, he saw Andre Lotz's paintings in person at exhibitions in Paris and read books about Lot. Kuloda was very moved by um, sensitivity, reason, and the solely construction of Lotz's paintings and decided to try to become one of Lotz's disciples. You know, so he, he didn't know Lot, but he just liked Lotz's painting and then he wanted to become his disciple. This is just one of the examples of the Lowe's works around that time. So Kuroda went to knock on the door of Lotus Studio at the Montparnasse Academy on May 20, 1922, and became one of the Lotus students. Um, Kuroda recalled that at that time, you know, the majority of Lotus students were women, and most of them were from Northern Europe, uh, along with one American, a few French, and Kuroda was the only Japanese. Kuroda Jutalo's decision to study under load might have been a coincidence, but might also have been related to the broader concerns with Cubism in Japanese art circles around that time. You know, similar to Koga's efforts to combine a cubist style with classical motif, Kuroda sought to avoid a cubist style that might call empty formalism. Um, and accordingly, Lotz's works, which I'm showing you here, embracing a cubist visual language, but also depicting recognizable objects. Um, subscribing to a modernist movement while at the same time not totally rejecting classical technique might have a you know have special appeal to Kuroda because it matches the type of art he was looking for. This is Kuroda's work um, he painted around that time. Lord taught Kuroda that he should paint like a sculptor and sculpt what he wanted to paint. Lot also advised Kuroda to go to Louvre to see paintings of those old masters. Then he compared Kuroda's paintings with theirs and pointed out Kuroda's deficiency. As I mentioned, for Japanese artists, being able to study art in Paris was not very uh, was a very rare opportunity. You know, while in Paris, they were often busy viewing artworks that um, they had learned about from the publications, but not yet viewed in person, such as the old masters' works at Louvre. At the same time, they also searched for a new approach to modernism that could help them to overcome or challenging what they had been taught. <clears throat> 
So many, uh, for many of those artists who had only seen Western art in books or a limit exhibition in Japan, you know, digesting the long history of Western art tradition and simultaneously searching for the newer uh, modern approaches was very overwhelming. Therefore, um, you know, Lotus's, uh, Lotus's classical inspired Cubism approaches must have given Kuroda Jutalo and other Japanese artists a sense of relief. So in Kuroda's case, uh, when he arrived in Paris, he had just completed an extensive tour around Europe uh, you know, viewing major masterpieces of Western art, especially in the city in Italy and Spain, where he viewed artworks by artists such as Raphael, you know, Da Vinci, and um, you know, El Greco. So he was stung by those uh, classical Western uh, paintings, you know, the colors, the composition, and the technique. Um, and therefore, he bore no opposition uh, toward classicism. And on the contrary, you know, he admired the old master's achievements. And Andrew Lotus' semi-classical um, and semi-cubist style did not conflict with Kuroda's search for something new because uh, classicism and cubism were equally new to him. Kuroda and Lot kept uh, corresponding to even after Kuroda returned to Japan. Um, so from 1923 until the late 1920s, several of uh, Lot's paintings were exhibited at the um, Nika exhibition, which is the annual exhibition held by the most important avant-garde society in Japan. Here I'm showing you a couple of those those painting were, you know, uh, sent to Japan and got exhibits, you know, annually. Um, Mendeley started from 1923 until the late um, 1920s. So you can see there's a variety of style um, of loads of painting were shown in this exhibition, um, uh, and also, you know, a, vi a vi sorry, a variety of subject matter. Know, from the classical motifs such as new and figure paintings um, to landscape of modern France, as well as depiction of the sports. In a turn of style, um, it includes paintings in a more classical mode um, and emphasizes three-dimensional forms, um, but there's also you know, other paintings that use flatter and more abstract forms with greater uh, emphasis on lines and angles, and there's still others that blend lines and colors and shadows. Sorry, just give me a second. So in this way, Lo's inference was able to reach to our circles in Japan. Um, Koga Hadue, whose painting you can see on the left, despite never leaving Japan, painting the pieces that were inspired by Lo's work. Following the examples by Lo, Koga simplified the shape of figures and objects and tried to patternize figures or objects as flatly as the patterns on clothes or the patterns on the floor, um, which broke up any sense of volume and gave his painting a flat and decorative aspect. At the time when Koga was searching for a more abstract mode that could help him to break free from the bombs uh, of a realism, you know, loads of semi-realistic, semi-abstract expression provide a crucial point of entry. Similarly, Kuroda also continued developing the cubist visual language he received from uh, Lot to depict things in Japan. Um, in Modern and Child, which you was looking at right now, uh, Kuroda depicts Japanese women and children in local clothes by using the sculptural technique uh, to simplify the form and the shapes uh, of their appearance. 
Although Lode seems to have been quite well received in Japan, in fact, critical voices also emerge regarding Lode's work. Some Japanese artists thought Lode only produced um, mediocrity and that his theory was superficial. Yet the very need of offer up this criticism uh, attested to Lotus' general importance in Japan at the time. While many Japanese artists who were in Paris in the 1920s received some instruction from Lotus, you know, through the Kurodata's introduction, um, not all of them really follow Lotus' style closely. Um, in fact, most of the Japanese artists who visit Paris traveling between different studios and experiments working in different styles. Mai Takanji, for example, stay in Paris from 1922 to 1925, did not have a strong financial support and did not formally enroll in Lotus Studio. Instead, he explored and studied various modern approaches by himself. In addition to observed Fauvism and Cubism, he was also greatly inspired by uh, Courbet's work. In Paris, he developed his unique use of color, you know, such as the crimson red, exploring both realistic and abstract forms. And he also developed his own interest in depicting not only middle class figures, but also the people in the lower classes, such as the workers and the laborers. I want to show you a couple of his works he paints when he was in Paris. Um, he even witnessed the political activities in Paris, such as elections and the street movements mobilized by the Communist Party, and was very impressed. After he returned to Japan, he man uh, maintained his interest in depicting workers. So I'm showing you this work actually he penned after he went back to Japan. It's called A Family of um, the Master. Um, uh, he, in his painting, he used his unique choice of a crimson, blue, and white color to depict the family of the master carpenter, um, you know, who had just built Maeda's new atelier. Um, so they are the worker who came to, you know, build out his new house, and he decided to paint the kind of like portrait of this family. Yabe Tomoe, another Japanese artist who had studied Lowe's work, similarly explored various cubist styles when he was in Paris from 1919 uh, to 1922. He was especially uh, interested in depicting mechanical objects. You know, his approach to human bodies with uh, mechanical forms um, has some parallel to uh, Leger's uh, Cubist work. Uh, probably everyone can see the similarity. For example, in um, Yabe's New Woman, um, he contrasts the bright and the dark side of each portion of the new to create a um, mechanical impression. Um, the high contrast of black and white is uh, reminiscent to Leger's works you can see on the right, um, in which the mechanical surface with extremely bright and dark sides are often shown simultaneously. Um, another Japanese artist who stayed in Paris in the 1920s learned from both Lot and Leger, but eventually moved to surrealist style is uh, Kawaguchi Kikai. Broadly experimenting with an even greater variety of styles and avant-garde movements in Paris, um, Kawaguchi Kikai did not stick with one kind of style. Um, so you can see he actually stayed in uh, Paris and Europe for a long time. But it was in 1924, you know, he decided he wanted to stay in, in, in France a longer time. Um, and then he decided to extend uh, to really seriously consider what kind of direction of the modern art he should go. 
um, and he built his uh, himself a studio in Clamar, you know, the southwestern suburb of Paris, and began to explore various forms of art intensively. His friends recall that he had a hard time, you know, striking the right balance between the academic training he had previously received and the avant-garde style he desired. Uh, for example, here I'm showing you a quote from his friend who's also in Paris around that time. Um, his name is uh, Satomi Kazuo. Um, he's a you know a good friend of um, uh, Kawaguchi. You know, he said uh, Kawaguchi could not easily break free from the state academic training and techniques he had learned in the past, and at the same time, he struggled to resist the energetic charm of Forbison and Cubism, you know. Um, so many of the artists are actually really struggling like what direction they should go. So similar to Kuroda, you know, Kawaguchi also found that Lowe's approach of a way out of this dilemma. You know, around July uh, 1925, Kawaguchi began studying at um, Lowe's academic and exhibit his works at an exhibition Lowe organized to show his students' works in, a pa in Paris the next year. So um, during this period, you can see Kuroda, uh, sorry, uh, Kawaguchi abandoned the idea of a representing detailed service broke down objects into smaller and more basic visual elements, such as a block of colors and lights, and construct them more structurally. At the same time, Kawaguchi also you know, was inspired by the works of other artists who he had access to in Paris, you know, such as Modignani and Chagall. Kawaguchi was, you know, also beginning to use uh, much more defined contour lines and shapes, and a more subjective color scheme. By exploring the various possibilities, he eventually developed his own surrealist style in the 1930s after returning to Japan. Of course, not all Japanese artists in Paris study was a lot. Um, Togo Seiji, for example, staying in Paris from 1921 to 1928, first exploring Futurism and Dadaism before um, becoming deeply influenced by um, Picasso. Um, Togo uh, was a slightly different than the other artists. He didn't really go to this kind of academic training, so I feel like he's more kind of free to switch to different kind of style without kind of much burden from his previous training. Um, he first met uh, Marinetti um, and in Paris, and he traveled to Italy to attend the Futurist Movement events. You know, when he first arrived in Paris. But um, Togo soon returned to Paris, um, where he met Picasso in 1922, and he he was deeply, um, you know, moved by Picasso's work, and he began to explore a Cubist style. Um, unlike those artists uh, who had gone uh, to the you know, formal art school um, in Japan, Togo didn't have that burden. So, but it didn't mean like he didn't struggle, you know, he also struggled to find the right style for himself. Um, it was after he returned to Japan in 1928, he settled upon the Q, uh, surrealism to, um, you know, as his main uh, style, and became one of the uh, first uh, Japanese surrealist painter. Uh, Oh, sorry, I forgot to show you. So this is uh, Togo Seiji's early works. Um, it's more kind of Cubist, uh, sorry, the futurist style. And then um, this is the work um, after he met Picasso, and then he has some, you know, different approach. But he was uh, still, you know, struggling in different kind of style for a while. All right, so let's bring, um, bring you back to Japan again and discuss surrealism in Japan.
So the term surrealism first appeared in Japan not long after Andrew Breton's first um, surrealist manifesto that was published in 1924. As early as 1925, a literary group led by the uh, poet and critic Nishiwaki Junzabulo began to practice surrealist writing as a means to break away from the conventional norms of a rational except, uh, expression. Soon, um, a number of uh, Japanese poets and writers began to claim the mantle of surrealism for their writing, and many French uh, surrealist texts began to be translated and published in various Japanese journals from the mid-1920s. By the time um, in the late 1920s, surrealist practice had emerged across multiple artist genres, including literature, poetry, fine arts, and photography. And surrealism had come to be viewed as one of the most avant-garde artistic movements by the early uh, 1930s. In 1928, several Japanese visual artists um, began to create surrealist style works. And in 1929, the works of the three Japanese painters, Abe Kongo, Togo Seiji, and uh, Koga Kalue, um, that were shown in the Nika exhibition were labeled surreal you know, by critics. However, you know, during this initial period, the newly emerging surrealism movement was not always positively received. Theoretical uh, works by Breton and other surrealist uh, theorists uh, were often incompletely or incorrectly translated into Japanese when they received translation at all. This hesitation regarding wholesale adoption of European art theories and practice combined with the lack of clarity regarding the precise definition of surrealism led to vigorous debates in Japan you know, regarding the true nature of um, surrealism um, and uh, uh, its a proper road in the art world and as, as well as a great variety of in uh, Japanese uh, surrealism art practice. So, um, you know, although the term surrealism was widely circulated and often cited, there never exists a unite, unified definition of surrealism in Japan. But ne nevertheless, you know, these three artists, uh, surrealist paintings, um, draw uh, considerable attention. So both Abe Kongo and Togo Seiji had been to Paris in 1920s. You know, Togo in Paris, uh, for a while he met Abe, uh, who went to Paris in 1926. You know, as I mentioned, you know, Togo first experienced um, you know, different kind of style. Um, and he was you know, very into the avant-garde practice. But Abe Kongo, on the other hand, uh, went to the uh, Academy Julian and the Academy Rossen. So it was a little unclear to you know how Abe began to explore avant-garde styles. Um, but the newly emerging surreal trend must have inspired both artists who were in Paris around uh, 1926 and 1927. Um, because soon after they returned to pa Japan, they held exhibitions together, and they were considered two of the, you know, the first surrealist painter in Japan. Um, I here want to show you an uh, art magazine called Atelier. Um, they are around January to the 1930s. Um, they invite, you know. Uh, lots of artists and critics to write about surrealism. Uh, they uh, collect nine essays and 42 comments on surrealism from Japanese, you know, uh, intellectuals. Um, and in these albums, they provide a great divided, uh, diversity of viewpoints on nature and definition of surrealism. Um, but very interestingly, you know, this one was published in the 1930s, but at the same time, 
there's already critics saying that surrealism was in decline. So there's some negative thoughts and comments about surrealism. Such a negative response arose partly from the fact that surrealism emergence um, coincided with the rise of proletarian art movement in Japan. Um, there's this movement uh, insists that art should support and be more accessible to the masses. Right? So as I mentioned, you know, uh, Maeda Kanji, who studied art in Paris from 1923 to 1925, had been exposed to the idea of depicting, you know, laborers or people from the lower classes. He had emphasized a new type of realism that he decides, um, you know, would reflect the life reality of the people from working classes, you know, such as peasants or farmers. Starting in 1928, you know, exactly the time when surrealism emerged in Japan, the proletarian art movement attracted many avant-garde artists who began abandoned their avant-garde style and returned to more realistic style that could speak for the um, proletarian. So you can see Yabe Tomoe, for example, I just show you he has, you know, different kind of cubist style in the early 20s Paris. Um, you know, after he left Paris, he actually had a chance to go to Russia in 1926 and then soon turned his focus to socialist realism and joined the proletarian art movement in Japan in um, 1928. So this is one of his paintings he um, uh, submit to this uh, so-called uh, proletarian art exhibitions in Japan. So accordingly, you know, uh, many Japanese artists and the critics who support the proletarian art movement consider surrealism as a kind of a degenerate art that reflects only bourgeois taste and sensibility and ignore reality. Right here, I'm showing you the quote um, by the proletarian art movement supporter. He thinks, you know, this, you know, surrealism is just. Uh, um, you know, more suitable for the late capitalist period of history. So responding to this type of criticism, Koga and other Japanese artists sought to distinguish their, their uh, surreal practice from the definition proposed by Breton. So um, they come up with some very brilliant ideas. Okay, you know, you criticize the surrealism, but you know, if we have a different kind of definition of surrealism, then we should be fine. <laughs> so um, the point uh, Takenaka, Kyushichi, Koga, and others uh, propose a scientific surrealism that will respond to, you know, rather than avoid reality. So Takenaka argued that, quote, if we first oppose the objections of the proletarian artist to the internal contradictions of Breton school of surrealism, we can achieve an even higher form of surrealism, a new surrealism, which is the scientific surrealism. Um, so here I want to give you a little background about how this kind of idea come out. Um, this new form of surrealism also reflects the something called Kikai Shugi or machineism. It's a larger interesting that swept Japan in the 1920s in response to increasing spread of machines and um, mechanization of daily life and exposed to the potential uh, mechanized process from producing or even um, mass producing art. Because machines were viewed as a lacking emotion and following the rule of logic and orders, many Japanese artists and critics feel that reason and rationality were essential to accurate um, depiction of the scientific aspects of machine. So here's also another quote I found is interesting. Um, this obvious uh, artist who supported this so-called machine is, and um, he said that there are even people who have such a, uh, you know, fan fanatical adoration of machines that they go so far as to declare that there is no such a thing as an ugly machine. 
which means that all, all machines are beautiful <laughs> in their post her, um, idea. So here I want to show you some of the uh, images. So uh, Koga Halue in supporting this idea, in course, uh, incorporating contemporary machines and scientific diagrams into his large scale paintings. For example, in this uh, painting, The Sea, uh, he assembled a variety of uh, cutting edge mechanical objects, including the latest German airship, uh, Graf Zeppelin. Um, this airship actually just you know, flew over uh, Japan on this year when he painted. There's also some marine. There's also um, a forge for uh, pig iron and steel, which you can see on the lower right. Koga places the monumental female um, figures wearing a swingsuit on the right side of the composition. You know, he, uh, she dominates and even seems to direct the various mechanical objects in this painting. You can see this is really kind of the biggest figures in the painting, right? So this figure came uh, from a set of postcards published in Japan figuring beauties from uh, various Western nations. To be precise, she's in fact a famous Hollywood actress. Uh, her name is Gloria Swanson. <laughs> um, I want to show you another example. The main female figures in makeup through the window um, is from the photo of a popular Swedish dancer published in Kingu, uh, which is one of the most popular pictorial magazines in 1920s Japan. As we can see, um, rather than uh, taking up the conventional subject matters of the fine art world, such as landscape or figures paintings, the images Koga choose are mainly from the mass media, including magazines, newspapers, pictorial journals, and postcards, which were widely circulated among the general public. Images of Western beauties in the 1920s and 30s Japan represent a new and energetic symbol of modernity. They often serve as an idealized model for uh, emulations by the Japanese modern girl. The modern girls uh, with their bold, energetic, and aesthetic appearance challenging the traditional gender roles in Japanese society and then create a new image of a woman who had a free self from the constraint of their father, husband, or brother to become both an object of desire and a threat to Japanese men. Koga's works represent this initial period of Japanese surrealism which arose in the response to the growing complexity of the relationship between human being and the mechanical world, um, the mass produ production of popular visual culture, and the spread of a globalized transnational modernity. OK, let's go back to, to the late, late 1920s Paris. Uh, I want to introduce uh, one last uh, Japanese artist, Fukuzawa Ichilo. Um, he's an artist who studied art in Paris from 1924 to 1931. Um, he was exposed to surrealism in Paris and decided surrealism style will be his main methods going forward. Uh, Kawakuchi Kikai, you know, as I mentioned earlier, similarly began to develop the surrealist style in Paris. Um, while they Living overseas, both of them actually remained in close connection to the art circle in Japan. They sent their works to the avant-garde exhibition in Japan, and eventually uh, uh, Kawakuchi and uh, uh, Fukuzawa became the leader of a newly established avant-garde group in Japan. Um, this, this new group is called Independent Arts Association. And it's actually the art association you know, broke away from the Nika Society in 1930. While in Paris, uh, Fukuzawa went to see the exhibitions on surrealism and they became aware of this movement. 
He especially was inspired by Max Ernst's technique of taking part of the images from printing sources and isolating them uh, from their uh, original visual context in order to create a new and a surreal scenes. So here I'm showing you, you know, in his painting, April Fool, um, he combines several illustrations from uh, the scientific book, which is called uh, Amusing Science. Um, so you see, like a Koga, you know, he appropriates ready-made objects from mass media to publication and alter and recompose them on the canvas. However, you know, unlike Koga's painting, which praised the beauty of the machines with humans and scientific objects, uh, coexist, uh, 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 coexist harmoniously. So you can see Koga's painting as you're very organized, but in uh, uh, Fukuzawa's painting, you know, although the images were, you know, originally scientific illustration, you can see the awkward poses of the man. Uh, are emphasized and also the scientific meaning is obscure. Um, so you can see the uh, Fukuzawa, he figuring the uncanny and unsettling motif and composition. Um, his works offer a new approach to surrealism. You know, um, so uh, Fukuzawa's surrealist approach provide a kind of new solution for the main criticism surrealism had faced in Japan, namely that surrealism indulged itself in pure art and failed to engage it with social and political re uh, realism. But um, in Fukuzawa's painting, you know, he thinks that surrealism could be placed in direct dialogue with social reality and that surrealists should incorporate social reality into their artistic practice. So he's using, you know, scientific uh, object to criticize the science itself. And then, you know, sometimes he also, when he went back to Japan, he also used, you know, some of the um, subjects to, uh, in the surrealist mode, to uh, satirize, to mock, or to criticize contemporary society, uh, which, such as this painting, you can see, you know, the title speak itself, professors who were thinking about something else in the meeting. <laughs> so under uh, Fukuzawa's leadership, surrealism became one of the dominant modes of art practiced by this group. Um, the other member of this group who drew the most heavily on surrealism was uh, Kawaguchi Kikai, as I mentioned, you know, despite experimenting with different style in Paris, uh, Kawaguchi was struggling to develop his own personal style. It was only after he returned to Japan um, he began to develop his own style. Um, he developed a string-like visual uh, style uh, instead of appropriating, you know, uh, scientific objects, um, he mentally depicted organic images such as human bodies or natural objects, and over, uh, often arranged them against a semi-natural uh, background, surrounded by organic lines and shapes, as you can see on this painting. So um, a short conclusion, because we're um, about the time. In addition to the artists I have mentioned today, there were actually many other Japanese artists who visited Paris in the 1920s, including not only the painters who work on Western style paintings, but also the painters who had trained in traditional Japanese painting. Uh, but since I focus on development of Cubism in Japan, I have primarily discussed the artists who are related to these two art movements. Uh, for many Japanese artists, Paris provides a chance to explore both modern and classical art. As I discussed earlier, you know, sometimes all this new information proved to be overwhelming and thus many of them struggle to find their own paths and often only begin to develop their own styles and approaches after they return to Japan. 
Um, nevertheless, you know, their experience provides an invaluable cultural experience that breached the modernism in Paris with the debates and discussions of modernism in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ching Ching, for introducing us to um, a lot of artists that I um, expect most of us don't know much of. And um, I think this is a good introduction. I might have a few questions, but I wouldn't want to ask the very first if there were other questions in the room. Um, apparently not, so I'll, I'll go. Um, um, so your, um, your talk, uh, showed how the style and iconography circulated among um, those artists uh, in between um, Paris and, and, and Japan, and Japan being quite uh, in here in Paris. Um, but I was curious, and mostly um, that's the case at a, a crucial point with surrealism. Um, I was curious about how they were acquainted to the ideas uh, behind the movements and uh, we saw for instance the uh, fascination for some of them with the machine and there's a, a clear connection here with futurism um, but with um, with a surrealism um, which movement is not just um, a style in painting or um, um, the use of uh, a certain use of iconography uh, but a whole philosophy in a way, and, and also that is backed up by um, um, first a whole set of activities, manifestos, performances, uh, interruption, activism in a way, and um, in the other hand by um, a strong theorization of uh, the modern life of uh, the subconscious, of course, at the first hand, of uh, the political activities that an artist should involve or not in, and, and various, various uh, thoughts and, 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 and uh, that prompted meetings, discussions, uh, debates, uh, some of them very strong. Um, so I was curious of how those aspects of uh, the movements, but I think it's more crucial maybe for, the, for surrealism, um, were um, received and maybe took um, into um, action by uh, those uh, artists that take part into uh, um, debates. Um, were uh, you, 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 you displayed um, um, an excerpt of the. Uh, scientific Solist Manifesto, <laughs> uh, which is not a um, Solist, um, scientific Solist uh, text, um, which I'd be curious, by the way, to know the, the, the date. Um, and, and so, yes, I, I, I was um, curious about how they were aware and involved, at, at which point they were uh, aware and involved in the uh, thinking of the, those um, those movements, um, I know, for instance, that the reviews were very um, um, instrumental in the discussion, uh, which was actually international, not just involved Paris and Japan, but other uh, uh, areas um, and, and um, uh, of of, um, uh, of surrealism, but. Uh, could, could, could you give more um, um, information about uh, those aspects of how, yes, the, um, the the thinking of what's also modern art in a way uh, took part in the um, activities of those artists? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much for these questions. Um, you know, surrealism is actually very, very complex in Japan. And today's talk, I could only kind of touch upon a little bit at the beginning of the uh, what, when the surrealism first appeared in Japan, uh, because I focus on the 1920s, but actually 1930s, there's way more development and a way larger group of artists who work on surrealism style in Japan. You know, and um, so uh, you know, 
if you start different like Koga Harue and you know uh, Fukuzawa, uh, you know Ichiro, it's a it's kind of initial period for uh, surrealism. So they are more kind of like kind of a little kind of resistant, kind of like a start to have their own idea about what surrealism can be and what this kind of it's not really style, you know, like this approach should be. That's why I like really kind of search for their own interpretation of surrealism. But meanwhile, there's other group of people are also, you know, like doing kind of all kind of different kind of definition or approach of surrealism. So um, one thing I want to emphasize, like there's no kind of like a canon of surrealism around that time. There's just lots of small group of intellectual. They were doing either, you know, kind of like a discussion about surrealism in a small group or have their own definition of surrealism or try some kind of like surreal style or technique, you know, like using Max Ernest's style. Um, and they usually appear for like a few years and then uh, kind of disappear or some of the artists start to do other kind of uh, style. So it's kind of like multiple small group movements all emerge. Um, and, uh, you know, in my book, in my last um, chapter, I try to kind of you know, give an overall about what happened, especially in 1930s and, you know, like 40s toward the war. Um, some artists uh, really, you know, start to use this style to, you know, speaking of some kind of um, unspokable images during the uh, militarism, you know, because Japan entered the war in 1937 or 1938. So there's more and more pressure like controlling the language, controlling the, you know, avant-garde movement. So certainly the movement actually became one of the few are, are, are kind of, move, I won't say movement, you know, like art creativity that the artists feel they can uses to speak themselves, you know, unconsciously or consciously, but there's also that kind of suppression from the militaries and like uh, two of the serious artists were put in a jail for a couple months. Um, so it's very complex and so in terms of politically, you know, I mentioned from 1928 to around like early 1930s when the proletarian movement emerged. So there's kind of counter voice, right? They criticize surrealism and, and there's a multiple group of artists who are trying to you know, come up with their idea. Some of them actually follow very closely with Andre Breton's idea. You know, later they start to translate lots of Breton's text and then they have their own debates. And uh, um, Fukuzawa is actually a very interesting figure because in 19, 37, he wrote a book about surrealism, and then he started to search for some of the art that in Japan that can kind of apply to some of the idea of surrealism, such as you know randomness or such as um, you know combine with different objects from like a totally unrelated context, you know, um, and he found some like kind, of, kind of such as ikebana or the haiku, you know, some kind of literature can. He, he gave it an idea. He said, this is surrealism, you know. So I feel it's very, it's very interesting and very complex phenomenon around 30s. You know, there's a multiple group have their own definition, idea about what surrealism is. And some are very close to, you know, the French discussion. You see the parallel development. Some of them just have their own way <laughs> to discuss. Um, and meanwhile, the the, the society really changed dramatically, you know, from the late 1920s to like 30s, you know. So um, it's, uh, it, it, it needs another lecture to talk about the in entire, um, you know, like whole images about what Saluran is in 30s, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, I have a question about um, the artist's um, modernization of um, Japanese um, genealogies. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned this a bit uh, at the beginning of, of the lecture. Um, so I um, have, I think, two questions. One is if you could say a little bit more about the uh, influence of the Buddhist scrolls mm -hmm. or uh, works on print. Uh, in Japanese uh, aesthetic tradition. And then the second thing is, um, 
some of the paintings you talked about how um, um, the the bodies were kind of like sculptural forms, mm -hmm. but I was also wondering if um, they were also influenced by uh, wood printing, ah. uh, you know, wood blocks, because in the the legs and the arms, I also saw um, what we can see as kind of uh, wood-like uh, shapes. And so I was wondering if the wood block printing uh, tradition in Japan um, was also an influence um, in these uh, painter styles. Thank you so much for this question. It's really, really interesting and a very, very good thought about that. So the first question is about the Buddhist kind of context, right? Um, and then also, you know, the availability of a Buddhist painting or scroll. Um, so the image I'm showing you, uh, Koga's painting, that's kind of related to, you know, um, Buddhist thing, um, is uh, I, of course, I don't have the exactly like a, you know, the uh, Buddhist uh, hanging scrolls that he really used as a reference. Um, actually, a scholar was trying to, you know, argue there's some um, uh, Nirvana images he may be able to see, but those images were, you know, uh, unavailable right now. Um, so the the one I choose is this more kind of general uh, iconography. And the one thing about Koga is very interesting is he actually came from a Buddhist uh, family. You know, his parents are Buddhist priests. So he was actually, if he didn't paint art, he will be forced to become Buddhist monk, <laughs> you know, Buddhist priest. So he is very familiar with the Buddhist motif, uh, for sure. And then um, the fact is um, this uh, canon is actually based on one of the, uh, you mentioned about the sculpture, you know, like a Buddhist uh, uh, images, statues that in his family temple's collection. You know, I actually saw the real one. He altered a little bit. You know, the original one actually had a sword he is holding, but he took it out and then he kind of simplified it. Um, so I found this really intriguing, you know, because he is actually, you know, using this kind of modern language to depict what's sur surrounding him or like give this um, kind of old, uh, you know, traditional iconography a new kind of look, you know, new kind of. Uh, appearance, um, and then you talk about the uh, wood block um, in terms of the like, sculpture. That's a very interesting point. Um, I haven't thought about that. You know, maybe in this painting, he may have a little bit idea about you know, kind of like three. You are talking about three dimensional sculptures, might have kind of related to or inspire some of the artists to do the you know cubist approach. Um, it, it could be some possibility, you know. I know some of the um, modern sculptors, like Japanese modern sculptor, they end up also have, you know, took some inspiration from the traditional ubra, uh, not ubra, the wooden sculptures for uh, inspiration. Uh, but I haven't really put a thought about this uh, avant-garde artist approach. So thank you very much for your question. Yes. Okay, I don't need the it's okay. I don't need the number for okay. But I think the uh, uh question was for the emergency in the the seminar. Because I have to admit that I haven't heard about the artist uh, before. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm wondering that where are the all the artworks that these artists are affected now? You know. Mm -hmm. Because they remind me about the you know the Chinese artists who study in Paris, that they were even buried here. You know, Zhao Wuxi, Chang Yu, Tai Yu Liao. That, that's a very, very good question. Um, the artists I mentioned today, um, most of their works is in Japan because um, if you see, you know, they most of them stay in Paris only a short period of time. Um, I think the, the longest is maybe like seven or eight years. And then 
that's another thing I found is very interesting. Occasionally, they may submit the artworks to, you know, so, uh, the 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 so, the author show, or like an independent exhibition. But very very few. Uh, most of the then uh, first of all, they are struggling about the style, and then second of all, they were not that famous when they came to Japan. Um, and third of all, most of the artworks they exhibit around that time are actually in Japan. So it's very interesting. They, they were in Paris. They were kind of exporting the kind of new style and a new possibility. But meanwhile, the, their main uh, show or the main place they display are still back to in Japan. So, um, and, and I think it's, you know, kind of make things very interesting how, how in terms of like the parents in Japan really connect each other very closely because, you know, their works so were made in Paris, but, you know, display in Japan. And their work were discuss and judge and criticize in Japan, you know, in Japan's context. And most, so most of their works um, are in Japan right now. There's a few artists actually were able to, you know, uh, be, be successful in Paris, or, or, but it's very few, like Fujita, you know, one of the uh, successful ones that end up, you know, living in Paris. But most of them were, you know, still choose to go back to Japan um, to become, you know, their main place to develop the art, yeah. I have a question related to uh, this one, which I think is very, um, very interesting. Um, so you're suggesting that for some or even a majority of those artists, um, uh, they were rather interested in showing their work in Japan rather than in, in Paris or Europe, because maybe that meant uh, more to them. Um, and, and my question was, uh, and, and you, you started um, your work in that aspect, how did that, uh, those artists, which we, for the moment, uh, know a bit less than the uh, great uh, figures such as Fujita, how do they relate to both the artists who were successful in, in, in Europe or remained in Europe, um, though going back and forth and to uh, even uh, Latin America for uh, Fujita. How do they relate to uh, such artists as Fujita, for instance? And how, in the other hand, in a way, do they relate to other movements such as Mavo, uh, who mm -hmm. uh, we, we developed in, in, in Japan and yeah. was uh, in, in its own idiom? Uh, and, um, so how, how do they define the position towards uh, such examples uh, that were contemporary to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say each painter kind of doing slightly differently, right? Like, you know, Kuroda uh, Jutalo, he just, uh, you know, like uh, Lotus works. So he basically follow very closely Lotus and then he introduced Lotus to Japan. Um, and all the artists, uh, they all have some uh, friends, you know, like in Japan, you know, when, I mean, in Paris, like longer or shorter time, you know, and then there's actually a group of artists, Japanese artists in the 1920s, they are close to each other. And then when they went back to Par uh, to Japan, sorry, um, they start to uh, form an art group called 1930s Association. And then they start to, you know, use this new kind of group, a new kind of association to display the works they, you know, experienced in Paris and in Japan. Um, some of the artists, you mentioned about Marvel, uh, you know, some of the artists are more, uh, I would say like avant-garde, they might cooperate with more kind of avant-garde, kind of more, you know, they call Sanka means like the third section, right? So Nika is the second section and the third, Sanka is the third section. They, they may be more open to or willing to experience, you know, different kind of style. Um, but I, in general, I would say, I feel that in this talk, I also kind of emphasize like the artists who arrive in Paris or in, in Europe in general, they were just like a sponge. They really want to learn as much as possible, but not really, were able to develop their own style when they are here, 
you know, as my, my singing side, most of them are able to really develop their own style when they went back to Japan. I think maybe they could digest more or they could really think about more. Um, so they're making all kind of connection. You know, some they even make connection to our dealer, you know, if some they're richer <laughs> or even bought our works in Europe, you know, if they have, you know, rich, uh, but some they're just struggling just to be survive. You know, so they were connecting to the other uh, Japanese arts artists communities to help each other. Sometimes they use the same studio, or you know, they introduce you know other artists to each other. They have like a small group in in Paris. So each one have a slight different kind of path. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if I answer your question. I'm talking about the different kind of aspects. Yes. Okay. Many thanks. Oh, there, yeah, there's one question. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I was really inspired by, by your work because I did my master thesis on Okamoto Taro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my uh, question is actually about these artists of the 20s because when I did my master th um, thesis of um, Okamoto Taro, he was like really successful even in Paris. He managed to get into the surrealism circle and yes, was exhibited yeah. uh, thanks to André yeah. Breton. And my question um, is, um, is there, was there any um, opportunity or chance for these uh, artists uh, to, to be exhibited in France in the 20s? And how did they manage to, um, to learn from this French um, Parisian art sphere because um, I can imagine it was their like language and yeah. I ordered like basically I probably like visual uh, reception and uh, my second question is were there any reception from the French side or was only like one way to Japan? Yeah, yeah those are really, really good questions. Thank you so much. Um, I would say it's uh, from my research, it's uh, kind of like a random. I don't think they really want to keep distance from like a French circles. They also, you know, some of them met Picasso, some of them met, you know, other contemporaries, um, you know, Paris and artists, or not necessarily the people in Par uh, uh, French artists, but also like international artists who were active in the 20s, you know, in Paris. And um, the the people I'm showing you today, few of them actually, as I mentioned earlier, they have exhibited their works in the um, the Autumn Salon and also independent um, art show. Uh, but you know, I haven't done the research about how the French side, like you know, how the French, you know, the reception about that. If there's any discussion about that, I would love to know more, uh, for sure. And um, if you move the slide earlier, you know, I, I begin my lecture as a Kurota Seki, who, you know, is a one of successful cases. And when he started to exhibit his works, actually his teacher said you should suggest him to write his uh, name in uh, Chinese character. <laughs> I don't know why. So when he submitted to like a big exhibitions, um, he has this kind of Chinese character as a signature. So I don't know if, he did on purpose to show like uh, his his identity as Japanese or his you know from um, like other part of the cultural you know uh, or you know like Fujita is another case you know he liked to um, you know use uh, you know technique he learned from like Nihonga or in, like the more kind of traditional skills to attract you know um, the, the the market because he's he has a unique way to to um, you know, depicts the subject matter that is very different from, you know, the, the other artist, right? So you need to build up some kind of personal kind of style to be recognized. Um, but I know there's some artists also trying to cooperate it, um, but it just, uh, it really kind of depends on case by case. Um, but it's really interesting, uh, you know, questions and, and I would love to know, know more too. And uh, unfortunately some, those artists that really have really good kind of diary and then all these kind of letters to their friend talk about their experience, but some of them didn't have too much, you know. So we could only have the list of the objects. But you know, from now on, I believe there will be more. Hopefully, no more research. Maybe you can do a little more to to see if there's a other way of, around, right? Like a 
the French style reception or idea about um, the uh, Japanese artist activities. Yeah. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? Mm. Oh. Thank you very much, Ching Ching, for your lectures. Thank you for attending. And um, yes, uh, thank you, Ching Ching. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.